Escorted by American planes, two Jap Bettys, painted white and carrying green identifying crosses in accordance with General MacArthur's instructions, set down on Ie Shima. Here, just offshore from bloody Okinawa, Bataan No. 1, carrying part of the Japanese surrender delegation, was closely followed into the field by Bataan No. 2. This is the transfer point for Manila, where bitter tea awaits the Japs. Lieutenant General Kawabe, Vice Chief of the Nipponese General Staff, leads the surrender party. The reception, minus the presence of General MacArthur, is distinctly on the chilly side. This is complete capitulation, something the stunned Japs have yet to realize to its full extent. Meanwhile, their armies throughout Asia and the Pacific are crumbling in surrender. An army transport plane is ready to fly the delegation to the Philippines, where the Japs once entered in triumph. Signal Corps and Navy cameramen mark an historic passage as the members of the Japanese party take off. The Supreme Commander for the Allies, ready to take over in Tokyo, prepares for his departure. Standing on the balcony of the war-shattered city hall in Manila, he speaks a few heartfelt words to his victorious troops. Very shortly, I trust we'll all be going home. Farther north, HMS King George brings Admiral Rawlings, commander of the British Pacific Fleet, to a surrender day party aboard the USS Missouri, where the host is our own Admiral Bull Halsey. One of the features of the occasion is a surprise cake, baked especially by Admiral Halsey's personal steward. The design is one that appeals to the hard-hitting commander of the Third Fleet, and he attacks it with his usual forthright manner. You wouldn't think that a kamikaze cookie could stump the Admiral, but you never can tell. Well, as the Chinese say, one picture tells more than 10,000 words. Good appetite, Admiral. And even though Mother didn't bake it, that cake couldn't possibly be that bad, Skipper. <laughs> Plowing sedately through the Banda Sea north of Australia is the Takiban Maru, a Jap hospital ship complete with crosses and all the international insignia. But officers of the 7th Fleet smelled a rat. The ship was boarded and many unwounded men were discovered. Navy pictures show them being taken into custody. And just to make it good, cases of 75 millimeter ammunition were uncovered, labeled medical supplies. The ship was taken under guard to an American port where prisoners were interned. Just another piece of Jap treachery which didn't alter the final result. For the second time in little more than a year, Washington Airport sees the arrival of General Charles de Gaulle, head of the French Provisional Government. Secretary of State Burns is among the many welcoming diplomats. On arrival, General de Gaulle was lavish in his thanks for America's part in the liberation of France. A guard of honor is drawn up at the White House as he's welcomed by President Truman, with whom he held a series of conferences on France's post-war economic future. All of Washington's military pageantry is displayed for the man who is here to cement the friendship of France and America. It's a day they've been waiting for. It's a day of days for these sailors, and for the best reason in the world, they're the first group to be released by the Navy under the point system. Mustering out pay comes first for these 105 men being processed at Long Beach, New York. And then, 
an even more welcome piece of paper, that honorable discharge. Thanks, mates, for a job well done. With peace, hundreds of thousands throughout the country left war plants for the last time, and now we face the problem of reconverting factories. At United States employment offices throughout the country, former war workers line up to register for new jobs. In some cities, the picture is bright. For instance, officials in New York say there are more jobs available than can be filled. Civilian goods like ironers are already trickling from factories, and shortly, washing machines and other luxuries we've missed will be pouring from the factories at 1942 prices. And soon you'll be able to give that jalopy a well-earned rest. With gas again plentiful, and with new cars and new tires on the way, America will be rolling with a pre-war flourish. Yes, cars, radios, vacuum cleaners, nylons, juicy steaks. It sounds almost like a dream. At Palisades Amusement Park in New Jersey, the small fry get set for the diaper derby with the preliminary weighing in. This is the seventh year that these featherweights have competed for the most coveted prize in the nursery world. They're about set as they receive last-minute instructions. The track is fast, but the tots are slowed by the August heat. The crowd eggs them on as the grueling 50-foot course weeds out any three-cornered sissy. The fondest backers are those in the mother's cheering section, but it proves too much for one of the entrants and his mom. And what do you know? Little Kathleen beat out all the he-men with her nursery crawl. Come on, be a sport, pal. As for the champ, well, she's going to see that there'll be some changes made. Yep, the queen wears the pants around here. 